By the spring of 1987, Tranmere Rovers were in bad shape. Relegation from the 4th Division of English football looked like a real possibility, and the club was in administration, only the third football league club in history to require such a measure. The club was saved by two local businessmen, Frank Corf and the Park Foods millionaire Peter Johnson, who became the Rovers chairman. Staying in the Football League was the obvious priority. To that end, a former Tranmere Rovers player and manager was brought back into the club from Carnarfon Town. Johnny King had been commuting into Wales from Birkenhead when the call came to return to Prenton Park in April 1987 and save his beloved Rovers from the drop. This is part two of the story of Johnny King and Tranmere Rovers. After the two were reunited in 1987, the late fight for survival in the 4th Division wasn't triumphant or spectacular. It was a rather scrappy affair, and in truth Tranmere came closer to relegation than King would have liked. Even on the last day of the season, in the midst of an infamous relegation free-for-all, Tranmere's task was relatively uneventful by comparison with matches elsewhere. They kicked off against Exeter City knowing that a win would guarantee safety. And win they did. Ian Muir, whose name will feature prominently here, made the goal. His skill and trickery in the left-hand channel created the space for a cross, and Birkenhead-born Gary Williams was the beneficiary. A pitch invasion followed the final whistle. Rovers were safe. In a matter of weeks, Peter Johnson and John King had, to use a turn of phrase of which the man himself would have approved, steadied the ship. From now on, Scrappy wouldn't suffice. The fourth division wasn't enough. King had set his sights on bigger and better things. In the 1987-88 season, his management skills began to take hold, and Tranmere jumped from near oblivion to a much more respectable finish in 14th place. They ended the season with a run of seven matches unbeaten, the kind of form that would have made King's return much more relaxed. But the most impressive performances came in the first half of the campaign. In October, Tranmere welcomed Rochdale to Prenton Park, fresh from a two-legged League Cup exit by their hand. Muir's hat-trick stole the show in a rampant 6-1 victory that would be cast in an even brighter light by a goalless draw between the same two sides just a few days later in the Associate Members' Cup, at that time known as the Sherpa Vans Trophy. Muir also scored twice in the season's other high-scoring win, a 4-0 thumping of Stockport County at Prenton Park, and many more followed. He scored 27 league goals in 1987-88 because scoring goals was what he did. Muir was born in Coventry, coincidentally now my adopted home, in 1963. He turned professional with Queen's Park Rangers and floated around before finally landing at Prendon Park in the mid-1980s thanks to the foresight of Frank Worthington, the team's player-manager. Ten years later, he was Tranmere's record goalscorer, an accolade he holds to this day. Muir was one of those strikers who seemed to find a way to score by hook or by crook. He was a smart penalty box poacher, and had a lovely striker's instinct about him, as all prolific forwards do. He took penalties, and tucked home tappings, but he was no stranger to the odd goal that was altogether more showy, and his ability to link up with winger Johnny Morrissey, the junior to the Johnny Morrissey senior who played briefly for Liverpool and not so briefly for Everton, was one of King's most potent weapons. Muir was instrumental in the club's promotions under Johnny King before leaving in 1995, later playing in Hong Kong for a couple of years, before returning to the Midlands for a stint with Nuneaton Borough, a dabble in coaching at Stratford Town, and a football retirement spent in the greetings card business. The one route back into football Muir has showed an interest in has been the most romantic and overambitious of all, as manager of Tranmere Rovers. King's own dream began to come true the following season. In 1988-89, Tranmere finished in second place behind 4th Division winners Rotherham United, and took one of the three automatic promotion places. And so it was that King, who'd been in charge of the team that was relegated in 1979, was also the man who finally returned them to the third tier. Their last promotion had been in 1967, under Dave Russell, with King a part of his team. This man's story cannot be separated from that of his club. Rovers started slowly that year, and were unable to win a league game until their fifth attempt. But Prenton Park was becoming almost impenetrable, and their home form was the basis of their success. After defeats to Cambridge United in September and York City in October, Tranmere didn't lose another home league game. In fact, by the end of the season, they weren't really losing anywhere. They secured their promotion with just one loss in their last 15 fourth division matches and made decent headway in cup football to boot. 
as tragedy engulfed Merseyside on Johnny King's birthday in 1989. Tranmere's first major success with him at the helm was overshadowed by matters of far greater significance. But football, at Liverpool as elsewhere, gradually resumed a sense of normality, and when it did, Tranmere took their new division by storm. King's team took the jump in stride and kept their cup form going too. In the league, they racked up 80 points to finish fourth. They started with four wins in all competitions and later went on two noteworthy runs. Firstly, to tot up six wins in all competitions in the autumn, then, incredibly, to double that in February and March. There was also the small matter of an impressive draw against Premier League ever-presence Tottenham Hotspur in the fourth round of the FA Cup in November 1989. In hindsight, losing the replay heavily deprives that achievement of some of its sheen. When all was said and done, both Chris Malkin and Muir, prolific throughout the season, had scored a ton of goals to set up a playoff semi-final across two legs against Berry. The first leg was a 0-0 draw at Gig Lane, the second a 2-0 Tranmere victory at Prenton Park. You already know which two players scored the goals. But Tranmere had Wembley business to attend to even before they went head-to-head with Notts County in their playoff final. In 1990 they won the Leyland Daft Trophy, the club's first major honour. Having seen off Chester City twice, Rochdale and Bolton Wanderers, Tranmere played Doncaster Rovers over two legs in the Northern Final. The first leg was at home, and the deadly duo were at it again. Muir had a shot blocked and then dinked the rebound over the goalkeeper to give Tranmere the lead in the first half. Malkin prodded the second over the line from close range in the second. A 1-1 draw at Doncaster was enough, and the first showpiece final of Tranmere's season was set. And so to the Wembley doubleheader, which was to become something of a habit. King was in fine fettle at the Leyland Daft Trophy final, boot on the air and all. He watched his team take on third division winners Bristol Rovers, against whom Tramir had struggled during the season. Malkin and Muir combined to calm any touchline nerves, not that they were any on display. Malkin's towering knockdown found Muir near the edge of the box, and he hooked a sweet acrobatic volley across the goalkeeper and into the corner of the net. Later, with the game poised at 1-1 thanks to Devon White's thumping finish, Muir added an assist to his goal by setting up the winner. Mark Hughes, formerly of Bristol Rovers, won a tackle inside the opposition penalty area, and the ball squirmed away to Muir. His lofted cross was met by Jim Steele, and Tranmere were back in front and destined to stay there. But when Stanley Matthews handed the trophy to Tranmere skipper Jim Harvey, manager Jerry Francis and Bristol Rovers felt aggrieved. Tranmere goalkeeper Eric Nixon, they said, committed a foul on the edge of his penalty area that went unpunished. More serious in their eyes was an apparent push by Steele on defender Jeff Twentyman as the pair braced themselves to compete for Muir's cross for the winning goal. There was no such luck for Tranmere in their second Wembley visit a week later. A second successive promotion proved out of reach and Notts County eased to a 2-0 win under the Twin Towers. But it was a mere delay. Johnny King's trip to the moon continued to soar. Tranmere won two fewer points in 1990-91 than they had in the previous season yet they were promoted to the second tier for only the second time in their history. Such are the glorious vagaries of playoff football. In a reversal of fortunes from the previous year, Tranmere succeeded in the playoff final but lost in the Leyland Daft Trophy, as they once again earned two trips to Wembley. Muir, of course, was on fire in that trophy run. Scoring eight goals, including a hat-trick in the first leg of the Northern Final against Preston North End. But it was in the promotion battle that Tranmere finally came out on top to achieve their second promotion in three years. Again, repeated shifts in Tramley's divisional status would later become habitual. Their success in 1990-91 was ignited in March, when King's team won six league matches in a row, beating Wigan Athletic, Swansea City, AFC Bournemouth, Chester City, Shrewsbury Town and Cambridge United. As their surge to the playoff continued, they won another four in a row in April to finish in fifth place. Just as they had in the previous season, Tranmere drew their playoff semi-final first leg away, this time 2-2 at Griffin Park against Brentford, and completed the job on Merseyside. A Jed Brannan goal against the Bees was enough to take Rovers back to Wembley. King named a number of youngsters in his team that faced Bolton Wanderers in the final, and it was an excruciatingly tense afternoon. Goalkeeper Nixon was forced into a full-stretch diving save in the middle of the second half as the team struggled to find a breakthrough, and then, right at the death, a bouncing shot from Phil Brown ticked up and hit Nixon in the face. When your luck's in, your luck's in. The game finished goalless, and extra time was needed to separate the teams. Tranmere had the composure when it was needed. 
Morrissey clipped a superb pass into the channel to set Brannan clear on goal. His shot was blocked, but Malkin, a substitute that day, was on hand to bury it in the bottom corner. Tranmere were promoted to the second division, or, to give it its ridiculous 1990s English football label, Division 1. With Rovers in the second tier, it was time for King and his chairman, Peter Johnson, to get serious, and the first order of business was to build the greatest team in the history of Tranmere Rovers, the crew of the famous trip to the moon. John Aldridge was the jewel in the crown, the ultimate manifestation of King's nous in the transfer market. But that team was something else. Experienced players like Muir, Morrissey and long-serving goalkeeper and captain Nixon were joined by King's new signings. Their number soon included Pat Nevin, who played for Tranmere between 1991 and 1997. Tony Thomas, Kenny Irons and John McGreal all graduated into the Rovers' first team under King and went on to rack up the better part of a thousand appearances between them. But King's Tranmere wasn't about personnel as much as style. The tactical approach they deployed made their successes all the more impressive. King seldom compromised. Tranmere's football was, appropriately, swashbuckling. They knew how to pass and play through the lines, and they often played effectively with a front three. Aldridge got off to a flyer in Division 1, scoring twice on opening day in a 2-0 win at Brighton and Hove Albion. In fact, he scored in every game Tranmere played in August 1991, totalling nine goals in five matches, including a hat-trick and a 4-3 win over Halifax Town in the first round of the League Cup. Rovers found their new level more difficult, of course, but they didn't lose until they went to Middlesbrough in the middle of September. Truth be told, their form was distinctly mid-table in nature, save for a winless run of seven matches around the turn of the year and a couple of decent winning streaks. Three games here, three games there. It was enough to finish safely in 14th. As Muir's influence waned, Aldridge banged in goals like they were going out of fashion. Nevin, a former Loney, made his second debut in March 1992 and became an effective and thrilling winger in King's highly dynamic setup. He eventually played 227 times for Tranmere before returning to Scotland to play for Kilmarnock. 91-92 was a real test of King's mettle, but it also offered a breather away from the drama of Wembley finals. A brief one, as it turned out. The most eye-catching match of the season wasn't in the league, but in the first round of the Full Members' Cup, by now the Zenith Data Systems Cup, on October the 1st. Aldridge's hat-trick wasn't his first or his last, not even close, but you don't see a 6-6 draw every day. But, after 120 minutes, that's exactly how Tranmere vs Newcastle United ended, and Rovers won 3-2 on penalties. Aldridge scored another hat-trick against Grimsby Town in the next round, and scored again to beat Middlesbrough, before Tranmere were defeated by Nottingham Forest in the fourth round of an impressive run. In August 1992, the Premier League began. The new breakaway division was far from the polished global product it is today, but the split really did create the feeling that this was different. Football was changing. Shortly after he moved upstairs at Tranmere, Johnny King spoke openly about the belief he had at the time that promotion to the new league was a realistic target for his extraordinary Tranmere side. Even speaking in the late 1990s, it was clear that he felt it remained a possible aim for the future. There's a feeling among Tranmere fans that King's trip to the moon was deprived of its ultimate destination by means foul rather than fair. In a just world, they might not have needed three consecutive attempts at promotion through the playoffs in the first place. In December 1992, Tranmere were 2-1 up against promotion rival Swindon Town at the county ground. The match was abandoned because of a floodlight failure. Then, as now, a suspicious conclusion, when it worked so obviously in favour of the home team. The fixture was replayed in February, with Aldridge unavailable through injury, and Swindon won 2-0. To rub salt into the wound, Tranmere's late charge wasn't enough, and it was Swindon who defeated them in the playoff semi-final by a single goal in May. King guided Tranmere back into the playoffs the following season, though he finished a long way behind promoted Crystal Palace and Nottingham Forest. Rovers came up short at the semi-final stage for the second time, losing out over two legs to Leicester City. But it was also in 1993-94 that King's Cup pedigree came to the fore and unwittingly initiated my first childhood interaction with a club I'd come to admire greatly in adult life. Tranmere's Coca-Cola Cup campaign began in the second round with a thumping 5-1 home win against Oxford United, whom they also beat in the league just four days later. Aldridge scored twice, Nevin three times, and the 1-1 draw in the return leg was a mere formality. Rovers won comfortably against Grimsby and Oldham Athletic, both at Prenton Park, in the next two rounds, setting up a taxing quarter-final trip to Nottingham Forest. 
Rovers took Forest to a replay and defeated them 2-0 at home three days later. Suddenly, Tranmere's cup run collided with one I was paying much closer attention to at the time as a primary school kid obsessed with Aston Villa. They met in the semi-final and for 210 minutes of football and a penalty shootout, drama dripped out of this tie's every pore. Next time on One Johnny King. One Johnny King was written and produced by me, Chris Nee, for Sphinx Football. My thanks and acknowledgement to the people whose work has informed this episode along with my own, namely Ryan Ferguson and Planet Prentonia, and Gil Upton and Steve Wilson, the authors of Tranmere Rovers 1921-1997, a complete record. Visit sphinxfootball.com for all of our podcasts. <laughs>